Hello everyone. This is Abhi here. Welcome aboard. In the annals of history, there are stories that define nations, struggles that shape destinies, and moments that resonate through time. Welcome to your special seven-part series where we embark on a remarkable journey through the pages of history to uncover the untold stories of Israel's formation. immigration and war in the midst of turmoil and transformation israel a nation born from the ashes of adversity fought not only for its survival but for the preservation of its identity these were not just wars of land but wars of people wars of immigration and wars of humanity Through this series, we'll delve into the heart of these conflicts, explore the challenges, the triumphs, and the sacrifices of those who played a part in shaping a modern state of Israel. Well, we'll unveil the human stories, the strategic brilliance, and the spirit of resilience that define these remarkable chapters in history. Join us as we uncover the echoes of history, the stories that have often been overshadowed by the tumultuous events of the time. We'll unfold the tapestry of immigration, formation, and the unwavering determination of a nation. So prepare to be captivated, enlightened, and inspired. Welcome to the history of Israel. Israel's unwritten chronicles it's a journey you won't want to miss let's start with judaism picture a time more than 4000 years ago in a land known as canaan which is basically the same place as modern day israel and the palestinian territories it's in this ancient spot that judaism first spread its roots now here's something cool Judaism, Christianity, and Islam share a common ancestor like distant relatives. They are often called Abrahamic religions because they all look back to the old traditions of the Israelis and the worship of the God of Abraham. It's like a family tree that includes big names like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the legendary prophet Moses. who got the divan rule book the torah up on mount sinai the jewish sacred text tanakh or hebrew bible and when it comes to symbols you probably seen that iconic six pointed star that's the sacred symbol representing the heart of judaism temples of jews okay So travel back with me around 1000 BC and there this legendary guy named King David running the show for the Jewish people his son Solomon takes over and decides to build this super special place of worship in Jerusalem it's like the first ever holy temple but you know how things go empires rise and fall By 931 BC, the Jewish folks find themselves split into two groups: Israel in the north and Judah in the south, like siblings, rivalry on a grand scale. Fast forward to roughly 587 BC, and it's like a blockbuster. The Babylonians come in and wreck the first temple. A lot of Jews end up in exile, which isn't fun. But don't worry our story isn't over around 516 BC they decided hey let's build a second temple and they do just that now here comes a twist the roman swoop in around AD 70 and you guessed it they demolished the second temple 
it's like temple history on a roller an coaster ancient ride community okay picture this way back during the ottoman empire days there were already a group of cool jewish folks hanging out in palestine they were mainly chilling in places like jerusalem tiberias and hebron it's like they were the og squad of the region but you know how life goes people come and go so sometimes the jewish presence in palestine was like a game of hide and seek now you see now you don't now here's the fun part in the year 1880 before the immigration part started there were about 25000 jewish folks already there just vibing in palestine they would been around for generations so it's kind of like they would put down some roots and then cue the theme music here comes zionism it's the fancy word for a movement that's all about saying hey let's reboot the idea of jewish nation in what's now israel the beginning of zionism and immigration picture this it's the late 1800s and a bunch of adventurous jewish folks from different parts of europe decided to go on a grand adventure they call themselves zionists because they share a dream they want to create their very own homeland in a place with historical significance which happens to be in the area we now known as israel it's like the ultimate group project their journey officially kicks off in 1882 when they are like let's do this man and start the zionist movement but instead of business meetings in boring board rooms they gather in basel switzerland in 1897 for the first ever official meet up kind of like a massive family reunion but with a world changing agenda now let's talk waves i know what you're thinking no not that ocean not that waves but waves of people the first wave called aliyah happens between 1882 and 1903 it's like a group of 20000 to 30000 russian jews saying adios to craziest russians programs that those were not fun and embarking on a quest to create a new home the second wave from 1903 to 1914 is like part 2 of an epic adventure movie this time 35000 to 40000 more russian jews join the action and guess what many of them are socialists they got busy building the city of tel aviv and even start the cool collective village called kibbutzim all right let's rewind the clock to 1914 the ottoman empire was this colossal mixtape of cultures with around 25 million people living there picture this 10 million turks 6 million arabs 1.5 million kurds 1.5 million greeks and 2.5 million armenians it was like a great me- melting pot of diversity almost like a united nations party but then world war 1 crashes onto the scene from 1915 to 1919 no one's really throwing a big party for the ottoman empire but here comes the germans looking for the third hide and seek but here comes the germans looking for a little hide and seek the ottomans are like sure come on you can hide behind our couch and they even fire off some fireworks towards the russian black sea port on october 29 1914 like a friendly welcome right but hold on the fun's just started france great britain and russia they are like the cool trio in the story and 
they are not thrilled with the Ottoman Empire's party games. So they decided, you know what, let's declare a war on the Ottoman Empire. Shenanigans. In 1915. All right, folks, let's take a quick trip back to the early 1900s. It's like a soap opera with lots of secret agents. So you got the big players in the game, Russia, France and Britain. In 1915, Russia gets promised Istanbul and control over the streets. France, well, they get to throw a fancy party in Syria and Cilicia. And Britain's like, hey, we are already annexed Cyprus and Egypt is our basically here under our watch. It's like a game of let's divide the sandbox among friends. But wait, there's more. In 1916, France gets an official pat on the back with the Sky's Picot Agreement. They can keep their sphere of influence in the Middle East and expand eastwards all the way to Mosul in Iraq. Britain, on the other hand, gets a big slice of Mesopotamia as far north as Baghdad. And to sweeten the deal, they got control of places like Haifa and Acre, plus a fancy connecting road between Mesopotamia and Haifa Acre. Now for the grand final, Palestine, it's like the international hotspot everyone wants to manage. But Hold on. While these world powers were having their tea parties, the local Palestinian Arabs had their own ideas. They believed that the British promised them independence in a series of letters called Hussein McMahon Correspondence. It was like a pen pal pact between Sir Henry McMahon and Hussein Abin Ali. They thought the British were on the side against the Ottomans during the war, but plot twist. In May 1916, Britain, France and Russia had another secret chat. The Sky's Picot Agreement as they basically said, most of Palestine, we are going to internationalize it. Confusing, right? Now, fast forward to 1917. and Arthur Balfour writes a letter to Lord Lionel Walter Rothschild which becomes the Balfour declaration it was like saying hey let's set up a homeland for the jewish people in palestine but let's not mess with the non jewish folks it wasn't just an act of generosity it was a bit of motivation strategy for some allies During World War I, Palestine took a real hit. Between battles, famine, epidemics and Ottoman measures, it wasn't a great time for anyone. Finally, in December 1917, Jerusalem was captured by the British and their friends. The rest of the area followed suit by October 1918. But wait, the future of Palestine was still up in the air. Now, here's the juicy part. On March 20, 1920, Palestine joins a big party in Damascus with other Syrian delegates. They're all like, we don't want this Balfour declaration thing. And they, el- they elect Faisal I as the king of the United Syria, including Palestine. The empire strikes, strikes back for the locals. This resolution echoes another from early in 1919 when the first Palestinian Arab conference said no no Zionism activities It's like they are standing up for the first turf in a time of international intrigue What is Zionism anyway All right The stage is set for our next act, Zionism. It's like this grand idea, a movement 
where the goal is to create and support a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the ancient hangout spot of the Jews, or as they call it, Eretz Yisrael, which means the land of Israel. It's like throwing a massive homecoming party for a whole nation. Now, nah, here's the cool part. Zionism wasn't just born yesterday. Sure, it started making waves in Eastern and Central Europe in late 1800s, but it's kind of like a revival of the age-old connection between the between the Jews, the religion, and the historical land of Palestine. I mean, there is a hill in ancient Jerusalem named Zion. That's where the name comes from. But hold on. The plot thickens. In April 1920, there's a little drama in the old Jerusalem Jewish quarter, anti-Zionist rights, like a real-life action scene. Sadly, it leads to some folks getting hurt and things getting a bit messy. The British authorities, they are like the referees in the game and they point fingers at Arab disappointment. You see, the locals were feeling let down because those promises of independence weren't really panning out. Plus, there were these wild ideas some Muslims and Christian leaders were like, whoa, what if there's this massive wave of Jewish folks coming in? It's like a mix of fear and misunderstanding and that's when things hit the fan. July 1920 Fast forward, forward a bit and it's like a scene changing in a play. The British decided to shake things up. They are like out with the military administration and in with the new Sicilian administration. It's like changing from a rough draft to the final script. And here comes a charter named Sir Herbert Samuel, a full-fledged Zionist. He gets the role of the first High Commissioner. The new team is all about putting that Balfour Declaration into action. It's like a Hollywood blockbuster with more history. Oh, they are throwing in a twist. They decide to set a quote for Jewish immigration. So. It's like a guest list of a part for a party and they are saying let's invite 16,500 Jews folks for the first year. It's like a big welcome to the new era. July 1920. 